After months of investigations into the attacks in Benghazi which killed four Americans on 9-11-2012, the most prominent issue now seems to be whether any further investigation is needed at all. Democrats Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration have publicly claimed the attacks have been fully investigated and further hearings are politically motivated. Chris, and you're right that House Republicans, in what is a blatantly political and partisan effort, have uh, voted to start another investigation into this matter, uh, presumably because the six previous investigations by Congress, by Republicans, uh, were somehow not adequate. Either people have gotten tired of Benghazi or they never knew about it in the first place. So let's not be accomplices to this diversionary tactic. It's all subterfuge. Critics can argue that various congressional committees and the ARB have investigated the Benghazi attacks thoroughly and further investigation is just a political stunt, but these protestations are themselves politically motivated. The fact is that the ARB and congressional committees which have held hearings have had specific jurisdictions and limited scopes of investigation. No single committee or the ARB has been privy to all of the evidence. The unresolved issues which remain prove that investigations to date have not been exhaustive, contrary to what critics of a bipartisan select committee say. This report first addresses what investigation has been done and how it is not complete. Next, some important questions are presented to demonstrate the need for further investigation. On October 1, 2012, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton convened an Accountability Review Board. She was compelled by law to do this. This was not discretionary. Under the law, an ARB is required whenever Americans are killed at or related to a U.S. mission abroad and the cause relates to security. The Secretary of State is responsible for conducting an inquiry and submitting findings and recommendations to Congress. The ARB is not independent of the State Department, however. The ARB is appointed by the Secretary of State for whom it investigates an incident. In the case of the Benghazi ARB, there is evidence that it communicated with the hierarchy of the State Department during its investigation. In the interview with committee staff, you were asked, did you update the State Department in the course of the ARB? You replied, quote, shortly after we interviewed Ms. Lamb, Charlene Lamb, I initiated a call to Ms. Mills to give her a heads up because at this point Ms. Lamb was on the list to come over here to testify. Now is the over here to testify, is that in reference to when Ms. Lamb testified in front of this committee? In October. In October? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and this Ms. Mills you refer to here, is this the same Ms. Mills who is Cheryl Mills, Chief of Staff and Counselor to the Secretary of State? It is. By law and practice, then, the Benghazi ARB conducted an investigation pursuant to instructions by Secretary Clinton, consulted with her office during the investigation, and submitted its report to her for approval after the investigation. More importantly, the ARB also has been falsely portrayed as being a full and complete investigation of the attacks in Benghazi. And over the last several months, there was a review board headed by two distinguished Americans, uh, Mike Mullen and Tom Pickering, who investigated every element of this. The scope of the investigation is not well defined by statute, but Secretary Clinton appointed the ARB specifically to examine the facts and circumstances of the attacks and to report findings and recommendations it deemed appropriate. Thomas Pickering, a retired U.S. ambassador, was appointed chairman of the board. There were four others, including Admiral Michael G. Mullen. An ARB investigation is not a criminal investigation. The Benghazi ARB did not identify the perpetrators or discuss efforts to bring those responsible to justice. Notwithstanding Secretary Clinton's characterization of the ARB report as complete, she and the State Department have justified incomplete cooperation with congressional investigations by citing an ongoing criminal investigation by the FBI. Thus, at the same time she tells the public that the Benghazi attacks have been thoroughly investigated by the ARB and congressional committees, she herself deprived those investigations of the very thoroughness and completeness she now claims for them. There are other key issues not resolved by the Benghazi ARB. First, there is the issue of substandard physical security at the Benghazi mission. 
physical security standards are governed by the Secure Embassy Construction and Counterterrorism Act of 1999 and the Overseas Security Policy Board. The ARB found that the mission facility fell far short of OSPB standards when it was acquired in November 2011 and remained so even in September 2012. The Secure Embassy Construction and Counterterrorism Act sets requirements for co-location and setback for U.S. diplomatic facilities. There are exceptions for offices located in certain types of buildings, such as a shared commercial office building, but these exceptions do not apply to the Benghazi mission. SECCA permits waivers where co-location and setback requirements are not met. Waivers are to be exceptional, however, and can only be approved by the Secretary of State. The Benghazi mission did not meet the co-location or setback requirements, and there was no waiver for them. The ARB found that the physical security requirements did not apply on the basis that the mission was not a diplomatic facility as defined by law, because the Libyan government had not been given notice of the facility as required by treaty, the Vienna Conventions on Diplomatic and Consular Relations. The ARB provides no facts to support its conclusion that the mission was not a proper diplomatic facility as defined by law. Even if the ARB is correct and avoids the requirements of SECCA, the failure of the Benghazi mission to meet safety requirements in such a high-risk environment remains an issue. How was the mission allowed to open and function without qualifying for the recognition as a diplomatic facility under the Vienna Conventions? The ARB ignored this issue. In reality, the ARB's position seems contrived. The State Department's position has consistently been that existing physical standards applied to the Benghazi mission. Aside from the recognition by the Department and Embassy personnel that the mission was subject to SECCA standards, there is no evident reason to believe that the Libyan government had not been notified of the diplomatic post in Benghazi as the ARB claims. We know the U.S. was relying in significant part on Libya for security. The Libyan government arranged for the 17 February Martyrs Brigade to provide security at the mission. Additionally, we know Ambassador Stevens had requested additional Libyan police presence at the mission for his visit in September 2012. A letter written by Ambassador Stevens to the head of the Libyan Ministry of Foreign Affairs was recovered from the mission after the attack. It states, quote, The United States Special Mission Benghazi presents its compliments to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. On Sunday, September 9, 2012, the U.S. mission requested additional police support at our compound for the duration of U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens' visit, unquote. Clearly, the U.S. Ambassador was appealing to the host nation to meet its obligations under the Vienna Conventions. In this interview with a Libyan reporter, Ambassador Stevens states that the U.S. was invited by the Libyan government to have its diplomatic office in Benghazi. The evidence refutes the ARB's contention that the Benghazi mission was not a diplomatic facility under the Vienna Conventions and its finding that SECCA did not apply. By its finding that SECCA did not apply, the ARB avoided the issue of culpability for the agency's failure to meet its legal requirements. The ARB report discusses insufficient security in Libya and a wholly inadequate ability to respond to the attacks. Yet, two decisions which had significant impact on the United States' ability to respond on 9-11-2012 is given scant attention. Before the attacks on 9-11, violence was escalating in Benghazi, but the State Department was materially reducing security resources in Libya. Although there were some physical upgrades made at the mission and others were in the works, such as security cameras awaiting installation, the 16-member Site Security Team, or SST, was reduced to four persons and they were reduced to a training role exclusively for Libyan forces. A DC-3 aircraft used by the embassy to transport personnel and material between Tripoli and Benghazi was taken away in 2012. These were decisions of Patrick Kennedy, Under Secretary of State. Neither decision is mentioned by the ARB. It took two and a half hours for the security team from the Tripoli Annex to secure a plane to fly to Benghazi. How, if at all, the DC-3 could have facilitated a quicker response is completely ignored by the ARB. The ARB places considerable culpability on Ambassador Stevens for security shortcomings, saying he did not advocate forcefully enough, but at the same time it reports that security-related requests from Tripoli were rejected by Washington. 
The ARB also reports that Ambassador Stevens independently made the decision to go to Benghazi, but why Ambassador Stevens was in Benghazi is not examined. How the ARB eliminates the possibility that he was there at the behest of Washington is unknown. Now let me explain why we were there. This was the heart of the Libyan revolution. We knew that there were dangerous people uh, in and around Benghazi. We also knew that there were a lot of loose weapons, and part of what we were doing there was trying to get leads on recovering those loose weapons. And we knew that there were smuggling routes that could go into Egypt, into Sinai, threaten Israel. So there were very important reasons why we were there, not just uh, the State Department, but other government agencies. Although the ARB takes the view that Libya, as the host nation, had no duty under the Vienna Conventions to protect the post because the U.S. had not given proper notification of it, it inconsistently is critical of the actions of the Libyan government and its agents on whom the U.S. relied in part for security. Yet the ARB does not examine the reasons for their failures or responsibility for them. On the night of the attacks, Libya was never asked for clearance for air assets except for aircraft from Germany for evacuation. Again, the ARB does not address this issue. Not only was the ARB's investigation limited by its scope, but also limited by its methodology. It specifically excluded the department's highest level of officials from all scrutiny. The ARB report states that over 100 witnesses were interviewed, but we do not know who they are. We do know of some who were not, however. Um, did, you, did the ARB ever talk to Lieutenant Colonel uh, Stephen Gibson? We did not. Did you or anybody in the ARB speak with anybody from the Office of Security Cooperation located at the embassy? We were in touch with and spoke with, actually interviewed uh, the, the defense attache. Uh, but not within yeah. the Office of Security Cooperation. What about, uh, who is Colonel George Bristol? I don't know. He is the commander of Joint Special Operations Task Force Trans-Sahara, directly responsible for the Office of Security Cooperation, uh, and was not interviewed by the ARB. Did you ever speak with Rear Admiral Richard Landolt, Director of Operations for Afri AFRICOM? Uh, not directly, no. And nobody within the ARB did as no, well? No, but actually, we, we were certainly aware of his input, having interviewed, uh, I'm sorry, having spoken with the Joint Staff and the Director of Operations on the Joint Staff. Uh, he was the director of operations at AFRICOM and was not interviewed that's, by that's the That's different from the joint staff. Yes, that's... I understand, and he was not interviewed. The Rear Admiral Brian Losey, uh, do you know who he is? He's the commander of Special Operations Command uh, at the time of Benghazi attack. Did you or the ARB interview him? We didn't. Did you speak with Vice Admiral Charles Joe Lighting, deputy to the commander for military operations there at AFRICOM? We spoke to uh, actually General Ham, who was his boss. But all of these people that I, I, I named off directly involved in the operations that night. And one of the concerns is you didn't read an after action report or review. We don't even know if there's one that's been done. All these people are directly involved. But they were not engaged in this. By excluding top level officials from scrutiny, the ARB was unable to answer questions relevant to what happened in Washington on the night of the attacks. The unclassified report is devoid of any discussion of the decision-making and actions taken by President Obama, his Chief of Staff, National Security Advisor, and others. Thus, the ARB's opinions regarding the effectiveness and efficiency of decision-making, communication, coordination, and cooperation lack a factual foundation. In the end, the ARB's investigation was limited. It was not a full investigation of the events and circumstances which led to the deaths of four Americans and the administration's conduct following them. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has purposefully and deceitfully misrepresented the findings of the ARB to the public. Share briefly the lessons we have learned up until now. First, the start of the night of September 11th itself and those difficult early days. I directed our response from the State Department and stayed in close contact with officials from across our government and the Libyan government. So I did see firsthand what Ambassador Pickering and Chairman Mullen called timely and exceptional coordination. No delays in decision making, no denials of support from Washington or from our military. Clinton intentionally took ARB statements out of context for purposes of obfuscation. To fully appreciate the deceptiveness of Clinton's public statements, 
it is necessary to consider the extent to which they are at variance with the ARB's findings. Clinton says the ARB found timely and exceptional coordination, but the ARB found considerable failures in communication, cooperation, and coordination, decision-making, and denial of support in the months prior to the attacks. According to the ARB, in the weeks and months leading up to the attacks, the response from Washington to a deteriorating security situation was inadequate. The ARB also found coordination failures which extended the use of the mission without proper consideration of security risks. So where the ARB specifically commends the ability of the government to overcome communication challenges on the night of the attacks, Clinton's testimony implies that the ARB commended the government's communication, cooperation, and coordination before, during, and after the attacks in all respects, which is patently false. Similarly, Clinton's reference to no delays in decision-making and no denial of support misrepresents the report of the ARB. The opinion of the ARB on which Clinton relies regards decision-making and support on the night of the attacks only. Hillary Clinton portrayed this much more broadly, however, and implied that the ARB found no failure to meet and sustain security needs of the mission. To the contrary, however, the ARB found management deficiencies at senior levels within two bureaus of the State Department that reflected delays in decision-making and denials of support precisely contrary to Clinton's representation. Clinton's dishonest portrayal of the ARB report is even more egregious because what approval is expressed by the ARB lacks credibility. The ARB's characterizations of decision-making and support from Washington appear to be based on inadequate information. The report states, quote, senior-level interagency discussions were underway soon after Washington received initial word of the attacks and continued through the night, unquote. No specifics are provided. As noted, President Obama, Secretary Clinton, and senior officials of the State Department were not interviewed by the ARB. There has been no accounting of the President's activities after the 5 o'clock meeting. It is reported, however, that President Obama spent an hour on the phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu between 6.30 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. After that, he may have been engaged in debate preparation, but the first presidential debate was more than one month away. After the attacks, in the midst of a re-election campaign, President Obama and his advisors asserted that he was fully engaged and kept informed through the course of the attacks. So he didn't ask you what ability we had in the area and what we could do? No, I think, I mean, he, he relied on, uh, on both uh, myself as secretary and on General Dempsey's uh, capabilities. He knows generally uh, what we've deployed into the region. Uh, we've presented that to him in other briefings. So he knew generally what was deployed out there. But uh, as to specifics about time, et cetera, et cetera, no, he just left that up to us. Did you have any f further communications with him that night? No. Did you have any other further communications? Did he ever call you that night to say, how are things going? Uh, what's going on? Where's the consulate? No, uh, but uh, we, were, we were aware that as we were getting information on what was taking place there, uh, particularly when uh, we got information that uh, the ambassador, uh, his, his life had been lost, uh, we, we, we were aware that that information went to the White House. Did you communicate with anyone else at the White House that night? No. No one else called you to say, what, what, how are things going? No. Okay. Immediately when word of the attack came, the president was uh, meeting with his top uh, national security folks. He was uh, talking to them well into the night. He was in touch with them uh, during the day as, uh, during the next day as well. So there's no question about the fact that he was uh, focused on that. There is no record of or claim by any advisor speaking to him about the attacks after the 5 o'clock meeting through the entire course of the attacks in Benghazi. No top national security folks have come forward to say they spoke to the president. There is evidence that President Obama was never in the crisis situation room where events were being monitored. All things. One, I was in the situation room that night, okay, and we didn't know uh, where the ambassador was definitively. In was fact, the there president was president in the situation room? No. And Clinton spoke with President Obama once around 9 p.m., at which time Sean Smith was the only known casualty. Ambassador Stevens was still missing. Clinton released a written statement at 10 o'clock, which references Smith's death. Shortly thereafter, it was learned that Ambassador Stevens had been killed also. Yet it appears that President Obama did not become aware of Ambassador Stevens' death until the following morning. 
Thus, even after the ARB's allegedly thorough and complete investigation, we do not know whether President Obama was informed of the first attack any time before 5 o'clock, and if not, why not? The ARB opined that there were no delays, but more than one hour and 15 minutes passed before the Commander-in-Chief authorized any response. From 3.45 p.m. on, live video feed from the mission was streaming to the State Department and the White House. From about 5.10 p.m., video feed from the Predator drone was available as well. President Obama never went to the Situation Room. What was he doing instead? If National Security Advisors were briefing him well into the night, as has been claimed, who were they? How were they communicating with him? If they were in regular contact with the President, how is it that he did not know about Ambassador Stevens' death until the following morning, when Hicks had informed the State Department the night before? Regarding the actions of Secretary Clinton, she has vaguely stated that she, quote, did see firsthand, unquote, what has been called timely and exceptional coordination, but there is a dearth of information about what she actually did during the attacks. It is reported that Clinton called CIA Director Petraeus at 5.41 p.m. I think at about 2 p.m., the secret 2 a.m., sorry, the Secretary called, Secretary of State Clinton called me, along, and along with her senior staff, we're all on the phone. And she asked me what was going on, and I briefed her on the developments. Most of the conversation was about the search for Ambassador Stevens. It was also about what we were going to do with our personnel in Benghazi. And I told her that we would need to evacuate. And that was the right, she said that was the right thing to do. At about 3 a.m., I received a call from the Prime Minister of Libya. I think it's the saddest phone call I've ever had in my life. He told me that Ambassador Stevens had passed away. I immediately telephoned Washington that news afterwards. In between 9.42 p.m. Benghazi time, when the first attack started, and 5.15 a.m., when Mr. Dougherty and Mr. Woods lost their lives. What conversations did, did either of you have with, with Secretary Clinton? Uh, we, did, we did not have any conversations with Secretary Clinton. So, so, and General Dempsey, the same is true, true for you? I directed several specific actions. First, we ordered a Marine Fleet anti-terrorism secure team, a FAST team, stationed in Spain to prepare to deploy to Benghazi. A second fast platoon was ordered to prepare to deploy to the embassy in Tripoli. A special operations force, which was training in Central Europe, was ordered to prepare to deploy to an intermediate staging base in Southern Europe, Sigonella and a special operations force based in the United States was ordered to deploy to an intermediate staging base in southern Europe as well at Sigonella. Some have asked why other types of armed aircraft were not dispatched to Benghazi. The reason simply is because armed UAVs, AC-130 gunships or fixed-wing fighters with the associated tanking, you've got to provide air refueling abilities, armaments, you've got to arm all the weapons before you put them on the, on the planes, targeting and support facilities were not in the vicinity of Libya. We know from the House Armed Services Committee's interim report that there were no preparations begun at any time to make Air Force fighters combat ready or stage fuel tankers for their flights during the entire seven and a half hours of the series of attacks on the mission and annex. Even though it was estimated to take up to 12 hours to accomplish and it was assumed that the attacks would either recede or end before such preparations could be accomplished, these were assumptions only. It was unknown at the time how long the attacks would persist 
are what, if any, usefulness military force could have had by the time assets were ready. The Department of Defense acknowledges that there were F-16s at Aviano, Italy, which could have been deployed to overfly Benghazi. It would have been merely a show of force. It may or may not have had an effect on the attackers. This is uncertain, but it could have had a deterrence effect. If deployed, an F-16 would have reached Benghazi before the attack on the annex at 5.15 a.m. Benghazi time. As limited a response as it would have been, it may have been the only immediate response available, and it was not done. Was it any airplane launched anywhere in the world before the attack was concluded? If you're talking about a strike aircraft, no, Senator. Okay. Was any soldier en route to help these people before the attack was concluded? Well, we, we, had, uh, we had deployed these fast teams, uh, and uh, they were, they on, they were the way, on orders to move. Were they on, was anybody in motion before the attack concluded to help these people? Anybody? Only the personnel that were in Tripoli. Okay, was any DOD asset ever deployed to help these people before the end of the attack? Would you rephrase, would you... Was repeat? any DOD asset, aircraft, or individual soldier ever sent, put in motion to help these people before the attack was over? If I could, the, as, as soon as we knew there was an attack, the National Mission Force and the FAST teams began... My question is, did anybody leave any base anywhere to go to the aid of the people under attack in Benghazi, Libya, before the attack ended? No, because uh, the, the attack ended before Thank they you. could get Thank off the you. ground. Okay, and we didn't know how long it would last. We didn't have the capability to station forces a short time, uh, play, as go to Suda Bay Creek. Well, there were. Do we have those capabilities. We do have those capabilities, but they even though we didn't do, but we didn't use those capabilities. Well, sir, th based on time, distance, and alert posture, as I said to Senator Reid a moment ago, they wouldn't have gotten there in time. It's an hour and a half flight, General. If you had had them based there at Suda Bay Creek, the ARB describes the movement of a security force from the annex in Tripoli to Benghazi, but makes no inquiry about it. Was the security force authorized to mobilize to Benghazi? If so, who authorized it? It took nearly two hours for the force to secure a plane and take flight. Although Glenn Dougherty was a member of this force and subsequently was killed in Benghazi, there is no known record of any member of this force or the security force from the annex in Benghazi being interviewed. Why not? State Department officials have discussed security assets assigned to Tripoli and Benghazi without reference to the security forces associated with the CIA facilities. One of the reasons we've heard that there wasn't a more robust response right away is that there wasn't a clear intelligence picture uh, over Benghazi uh, to give you the idea of where to put what forces. But um, when there was in fact a drone over the CIA annex and um, there were intelligence officials fighting inside the annex. I guess the big question is, with those two combined assets, why there wasn't a clear intelligence picture that would have given you what you needed to make some moves. For instance, flying, you know, F-16s over the area to disperse fighters or or dropping more um, special forces in. Uh, you know, let, let, me, let me speak to that, because uh, I'm sure there's going to be, there's a lot of Monday morning uh, quarterbacking going on here. Um, we, uh, we, we quickly responded, as uh, General Dempsey said, uh, in terms of uh, deploying forces uh, to the region. Uh, we had fast platoons in the region. Uh, we had uh, ships that we uh, had deployed uh, off of uh, Libya. Uh, and we were prepared to respond to any contingency uh, and, uh, and, and certainly had forces in place to do that. But there's a basic principle here. basic principle is that you don't deploy forces into harm's way without knowing uh, what's going on, without having some real-time information about what's taking place. Uh, and as a result of not having that kind of information, uh, the commander who was on the ground or in, in that area, General Ham, uh, General Dempsey, and I felt very strongly that we could not put forces at risk uh, in that situation. Right. So, so the 
drone then and the forces inside the annex weren't giving enough of a clear picture is what you're saying. Yeah, this, ha this happened within a few hours and it was really over before you know we had the opportunity to really know what was happening. The host country, Libya, had a responsibility for maintaining security of the mission. There were several apparent failures. Why was the 17 February Brigade security presence reduced from what it was supposed to be on 9-11? Why wasn't the police patrols present as they were promised to be? Two State Department cables show that Stevens' team warned Washington that at 6.43 a.m. in the morning, they had concerns that members of the Libyan police sent to guard them were photographing the compound. Quote, this person was photographing the inside of the U.S. special mission, and furthermore, this person was part of the police unit sent to protect the mission. What are we doing to identify the individual who was observed photographing the mission on the day of the attacks? Have we interviewed Libyan officials to determine why they did not provide a marked police car outside the mission 24-7 as Ambassador Stevens requested? Have we interviewed the driver of the police vehicle who left the scene as the attacks began? What accounts for the delays experienced by the security team from Tripoli Annex? The ARB doesn't account for the time between the initial report of the attack at 9.45 p.m. and its departure from Tripoli at midnight and the time between its landing in Benghazi at 1.15 a.m. and its arrival at the Benghazi Annex at 5 a.m. Why was there no transport and security assistance available at the airport when the U.S. security forces arrived from Tripoli at the Benghazi airport? Why did it take three hours to arrange it? On September 10, 2012, at least 18 hours before the attack on the Benghazi mission, Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri, in a video time for the anniversary of 9-11, called for attacks on Americans in Libya to avenge the death of Abu al-Libi, who was killed by the U.S. in a drone attack in Pakistan in June 2012. What, if any, response was there by the U.S. intelligence community to this threat? Why were U.S. military and embassy security forces not put on higher alert? Libby's older brother is a member of the Libyan parliament. He is described as one of the most senior members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, LIFG. In June 2013, he supported militia sieges of key government ministries in a successful effort to force the Libyan parliament to approve a political exclusion law, which effectively purged many moderates from the legislature. What involvement, if any, did he have in the events in Benghazi on September 11, 2012? Did he have any role in the lack of support that night when it was requested? The last meeting Ambassador Stevens had in Benghazi before the terrorist attack was with the Turkish ambassador. The ARB also reports that British diplomatic personnel were in Benghazi the same night. What was the purpose of Ambassador Stevens' meeting with the Turkish ambassador in Benghazi? Did Stevens meet the British diplomatic personnel also? On September 2nd, nine days before the attack, CIA Director Petraeus visited Turkey for secret meetings. Was his visit related to Stevens' work in Benghazi? Were the meetings in Benghazi and Turkey related to an arms shipment that left Libya for Turkey to be smuggled to Syrian rebels? Although not specifically identified by the Obama administration, a prisoner released from Gitmo in 2008 has been implicated in the attacks. Coincidentally, the Obama administration has been negotiating since before the 9-11 attacks with Taliban and Haqqani forces for the release of Bo Bergdahl in exchange for the release of prisoners from Gitmo. Is the administration's failure to bring Kumu or others involved in the Benghazi attacks to justice in any way related to the efforts to release other terrorists from Gitmo? By design or not, these issues were beyond the scope of the ARB. Based on what facts are known and the questions which remain unanswered, it appears that the Obama administration is concealing the true nature of the operations in Benghazi. If the U.S. government was engaged in black operations, which must remain secret to preserve national security and national interests generally, this would be understandable. What is not acceptable, however, is unlawfulness, dishonesty, and deception from the president and appointed officials. Under the, our constitutional system, the executive branch is subject to checks and balances to prevent abuses of power. Congress has oversight responsibilities. The congressional investigation into the Benghazi attacks may be more important for what it reveals in terms of an abuse of power and a systemic failure to prevent it. If executive power was exercised unlawfully, responsible parties must be held accountable. The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? 
What difference at this point does it make? Again, diversion subterfuge. Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. Why aren't we talking about something else?